Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Melissa Sweat, Customer Relationship and Community Manager of People on the Go, and I'll be moderating our session today. I have with us our founder, Pierre Kawand, and Scott Shute, who I'll introduce in just a moment. But before we start, let's just do a quick technology check to make sure that you can hear me just fine and see the screen. Please go ahead and locate the questions panel and go to webinar, and just type in a brief note, an OK, a hi, hello, letting me know that all sounds good. Awesome, thank you so much there. And now I'll introduce our speaker, Scott Shoot, for mindfulness meditation at work and beyond. Hi Scott, there. Oh, hi Scott, I'm gonna go ahead and read uh, your bio and then I'll go ahead and okay, pass great. it on over to you guys, thank you. Um, so Scott Shoot is the head of mindfulness and compassion at LinkedIn. He has been an active advocate for customers and employees in the technology space for over 20 years with roles ranging from sales to customer advocacy to customer service leadership. Previously, Scott was vice president of LinkedIn's customer operations organization. In his current role as head of mindfulness and compassion, Scott blends his lifelong meditation practice and passion with his practical leadership and operations experience. His mission is to change work from the inside out by mainstreaming mindfulness and operationalizing compassion. And with that, I'll turn it over to Scott and Pierre. All right, thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Scott, for joining today. I, um, as as you know, I've I've heard your insights at many different conferences and occasions, and I thought it would be just awesome to uh, to make these available to our community. And today, uh, this is what we're doing. So, uh, getting us started, um, how about we hear a little bit about your journey in getting here? Ah, uh, sure. Well, we could spend the whole time on that piece. But uh, first of all, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be here with you and with all of you. Um, let's see. Well, I, I'll give you the, the short version. So I, I think of myself as a bit of a dual agent. Uh, I, I had uh, an experience when I was 13, which led me down the path of meditation and uh, other, I guess, exercises like that. And it's been a big part of my life ever since. I've been teaching since I was in college. and uh, been a big part of my life in my, I guess, spiritual community outside of outside of work. And a few years ago, probably four years ago, I started leading a meditation class at work. And it was quite terrifying, actually, because you know I grew up I grew up in the Bible Belt, you know. And when I was a teenager, and we were talking about meditation, my parents wanted to have myself and my brothers deprogrammed, right? It wasn't something. It wasn't something you really talked about openly. It was quite, it was quite scary. But I'd reached this point in my life where, uh, honestly, at my career level, but also my personal level, my age level, I'd become comfortable in my own skin. So I thought, okay, LinkedIn is this place where it's pretty open. It's pretty, uh, we're all about transformation. So I started leading a meditation class at work. And the first time there was one person there, and I'm sure he was just as terrified as I was. I never saw him again. <laughs> and, then, and then the next weekend, or the next week, there were three, and then five, and then it just kind of kept growing into a regular thing, you know, to the point where we'd have a special, we have these once a month days called in days. I'd lead a special session and 30 people would come. Or, you know, the marketing team would have an offsite and they'd invite me to come and there'd be, you know, a couple hundred people. And it just became part of my brand and part of what I did and part of my identity, which was the intention, because that's what it was like, um, that's what I wanted it to be. And then about, uh, well, for me, the tipping point on wanting it to be a full-time job was last May, our CEO, Jeff Wiener, was speaking at Wharton. He was giving the commencement address at Wharton. And he talked about compassion. And then the next you know, three times he was on TV, that's all the reporters wanted to talk about. They'd have one question about LinkedIn or Microsoft integration with LinkedIn. And they'd have 20 questions about compassion. And I was thinking, Wow, it's time. It's time for us to codify that what this means. So if you send 13 or 14,000 people back to their desk to be compassionate, what are they going to do? Uh, it's time for us to take a leadership position in the industry. And so I made a pitch to Jeff and to our head of HR. And you know, starting in about September, October, uh, now it's my full-time gig. I'm the head of mindfulness and compassion. And as uh, she mentioned in my bio, my my job is to Mainstream mindfulness and operationalized compassion. So happy to dive in wherever you like. Yeah, thank you. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Uh, what a major milestone. 
And uh, so starting with the basics, Scott, how about if we define things like first mindfulness? So sure. how would you define mindfulness? And then meditation, how would you define meditation? Sure. And then mindfulness meditation, because we also hear them come together. So yeah, just some simple. Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> so I, I tend to use the word mindfulness in its broadest sense, right? And if I, if I had to pick only one word about all the things we're talking about, it's really around consciousness. But I don't know that we're quite ready for that word in the workplace. So we do talk about mindfulness. So the, the traditional definition of mindfulness is being aware uh, of the present moment non-judgmentally, right? And mindfulness meditation is where you sit and you're being aware non-judgmentally of all the things going on in your mind. Um, I tend to think about, and, and meditation is, uh, most of you know, a, an exercise where it, it's kind of a mental exercise and it's typically used to drive clarity of mind and a calmness, uh, an emotional state. Mm -hmm. um, and so those, those are kind of the technical definitions. When I think of what mindfulness is, when I, when I am talking about um, mainstreaming mindfulness, I'm specifically talking about more, more like meditation and the mental practices that are like that. Mm -hmm. So just, just like physical exercise has come of age, has become you know, mainstream over the last 50 or 60 years, you know, our, our grandparents, our great grandparents did not exercise, right? They worked hard. Um, in the same way, these mental exercises uh, are becoming mainstreamed, you know, and we're, we're in the middle of that journey. So just like physical exercises, now pretty much everyone knows and every company knows the benefits of physical exercise, right? Decreases anxiety, relieves stress, improves the quality of work, decreases um, medical costs, all of those things. The same things are true of mental exercises like meditation. And we're now in the process of, you know, just making those available to our employees. Uh, and I talk about having something available for every level of someone's journey. Uh, and so that's what I mean by mainstreaming mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So uh, in terms of making things available, do you want to give us a little flavor? Yeah, sure. what, do you, what do you make available at LinkedIn? What do people sure. ask you? How does it work? Yeah. yeah. So I, I think of having something available for every phase of someone's journey. So we have um, weekly um, meditation sessions in I think now 11 or 12 or 13 different locations around the world. LinkedIn's a global office with, with, um, with many locations around the globe. Uh, so weekly meditation sessions. In some places we have twice a day every day, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and these are fairly well attended. Uh, we have things like once a year we do a 30-day challenge. Right? And the, uh, this last year we had 1,600 people attend the challenge. And the challenge was uh, meditate 20 times within 30 days and be entered into a raffle for prizes. So we gamified it a little bit too, which is fun. We have uh, online, we have a thing called Mindful Moments. It's a two or three hour self-paced learning. We have uh, down at the bottom of the funnel, for someone who really wants to go deeper, we're doing uh, retreats, little mini retreats. So it's a four hour retreat, uh, either on a Friday or a Saturday. Uh, you know, and we'll get, we encourage people, if it's on a weekend, if we encourage people to bring their spouse or bring a friend along and have it be more of a community event. And we'll get 60, 70, 100 people coming to these. We are, one of the things we're doing right now is we're partnering with Wisdom Labs to build a, a community program. Uh, it's a weekly drop-in session for half an hour. And you get a, uh, a video of someone explaining a certain benefit of mindfulness or going deep into a specific topic. There would be a practice, so a six to 10 minute practice, followed by discussion. So really mm -hmm. trying to build that community. And um, now my, as part of my day job, I'm in the learning and development world. And so I'm building workshops uh, that, that span both the mindfulness and compassion piece of it. So now it's being offered as part of our, our standard portfolio of training activities. So those are, I may have missed something, but oh, and we have a speaker series. Once a month, I bring in someone from the outside, uh, not just about mindfulness, but more in consciousness or in the overall kind of wisdom topics. And we're, you know, we, we do something like this where we also include a practice and give some, you know, well, talking is good, acting is better. So those are some of the things we have going on. I'm, I'm quite proud of the, the offerings we have. Great, that sounds quite substantial. And, uh, you know, you brought up the topic of practice. How about, uh, 
how about doing a little practice maybe just like <laughs> <laughs> a minute a minute or so because one one of the challenges the challenge we had today for the people participating in the challenge is to do one or two minutes of breathing and adding yeah. that work day but uh we would love to uh, to guide everyone maybe sure of your favorite uh, short practice what would that sure be? um let's see i have lots of lots of favorites let's just do a simple breathing one because this one doesn't require it doesn't require any past experience it doesn't even require you to close your eyes so i'll lead you through the instructions first and then we'll do four cycles of breath so we're gonna do an inhale through the nose for four counts. So one, two, three, four. We're gonna hold it inside of our bodies for seven counts. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we're gonna exhale out of our mouth for eight counts. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like that. So it's inhale through the nose for four, hold for seven, exhale for eight. Now this whole time, uh, part of the instruction is to you know, place the tip of the tongue behind the two front teeth and just leave it there. So you're both breathing in past it and breathing out past it. So uh, let's do it and we'll do four cycles. Okay. And that's, that's kind of the standard practice of this is four cycles, it takes less than two minutes. So we'll okay. start with by completely exhaling everyone. And now inhale through your nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale through the mouth, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale through the nose, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale through the mouth, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In through the nose, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> Exhale through the mouth. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Last one. Inhale through the nose. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Out through the mouth. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then you can just resume breathing normally. Thank you, thank you. So this uh, one, when done you know, twice a day, perhaps beginning and end of your day, or just anytime twice a day, uh, it's a, a, a medical doctor is a huge proponent of this one and has seen some pretty spectacular things in honestly curing or alleviating pain in ways that uh, he found that standard medicine did not. So uh, give it a shot. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. So um, I, I would like to get to the business professional benefits for meditating, but first what are the, maybe highlighting a couple of the personal benefits and then getting into the business professional benefits as an individual and then as a company. Sure, maybe. sure. Um, so, Talk about it in two ways. At the, at the individual level, you know, the, the things that we have seen, the things that there have been, I think there's over 6,000 published papers now, peer-reviewed papers. Uh, so, the, so the benefits are, are now kind of irrefutable around things like reducing stress, mm -hmm. uh, the physical symptoms of stress, alleviating anxiety, improving your overall awareness, which in, leads to ability to focus, the ability to have uh, better relationships, the ability to sleep better, the ability to have uh, a longer attention span. So those are the things that are already there. And you might imagine how those could be, you know, improvements that are not only better in your personal life, but would lead to, you know, in the workplace, lead to things like, okay, if you have improved focus, you'd have higher levels of productivity. If you have improved levels of awareness, you're going to have better communication and better relationships with others. You're going to be better with customers. You're going to be an improved version of yourself. And so to me, all of those things then are a natural transition into compassion, right? I'm really interested in both pieces. The mindfulness piece is great for developing of the self, but we take that upgraded self into every relationship we have with others. And I think this is for me, even more interesting in delivering on the promise of compassion. Mm -hmm. So compassion 
you know, the standard definition is, you know, noticing and being aware of someone's situation or their suffering coupled with an ability and a desire to help. It's kind of like empathy in action or love in action, really. And in the business world, you can see how, well, what we know is that individuals who are not selfish, they are otherish, you know, from Adam Grant's work and give and take, um, individuals who are otherish are the highest performing individuals in the work workplace. And it's my belief, and there's some research that pairs this out, is that companies who are otherish are the highest performing companies over the longest amount of time. In other words, this is how you make more money. And it's not my primary reason for doing it, but it blends both my personal and the, my, you know, I'm a business guy as well. Mm -hmm. So this is how you build a great company. So otherish at the company level is having what I call this magic triangle of, you know, first there's the company, you have to have a good business model. You have to take care of yourself and have a good, you know, top line and bottom line. But companies who are on purpose, consciously thinking about their customers and providing value for their customers and consciously thinking about their employees and providing a great environment for their employees to do their best work. This is a balance of these three things. Mm -hmm. These are the companies who are more successful and get more done. Um, so to me, it's, it's not just a feel good thing. Like we're going to see that this is the way you do business. This is the way that you be successful, both professionally and personally. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it sounds like it's a win-win, no matter how you put it. Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah. And in, in Absolutely. Big way. Yeah. So if, can, what, I, can I share just a, uh, a quick example absolutely. Uh, of how some of these things work? And this is, you know, this is in the same world, but, uh, it, you know, as an example, there's this company called Wipro. It's an Indian services company. And they were doing research on onboarding. Right. So onboarding, you know, it's like day one of your new job. Um, here's the normally what happens. We'll call it group A is you come in, you have your six or eight hours of training, your technical training. You get your badge, you get your fleece jacket and they turn you loose. Uh, and, you know, in group B, uh, they had um, um, they had executives. They had an executive come in and talked about what that person really loved about the company, talked about the strong uh, mission and vision and culture of the company and why it mattered to them. And then in group C, they did both of those things, but they had the person think about themselves and when they were doing their best work, when they were most alive, when they were at their best. And then they introduced themselves in this way. And they followed them for six months later. Um, and these were individuals who were being hired to work the graveyard shift, to work the night shift, to support American companies, right? And so that was the only thing that was different, these different you know, 15, 20 minutes difference in onboarding. So six months later, they found that Group C, um, they had a 35% more likelihood to stay. In other words, retention rate had improved by 35%. And they also saw a 12% lift in customer satisfaction scores. And these are numbers that are very hard to move with things that we often take, you know, we're trying to do more training, we're trying to do way more expensive programs on the ground. But starting someone off in an environment where basically the message is, look, Hey, Pierre, we hired you to be you, not exactly like everyone else. Mm -hmm. And we want you to bring your best to this job. You know, even starting from that place, creating this, uh, this net of psychological safety uh, yielded incredible results down the line. Mm -hmm. Now, so to, to me, this is the, some of the beginnings of what we're talking about when we're talking about compassion, right? Because it's from a company perspective, it's not just about thinking about the company and, and you know, forcing you to do your role. It's thinking, how can I make you great? How can I create an environment where every individual can be their best and bring their best? So this is just some of the things that I'm really excited about uh, changing the world of work from the inside out. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. And I heard you, uh, Scott, talk before about a big message about bringing your authentic self to work. Yes. And, uh, do you want to tell us a little more about this? And sure. And it out for you? Um, yeah, I think there's, well, first of all, we're several things going on. Um, we start as humans with a negativity bias, right? We are programmed, not hardwired, but we are programmed for hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years to have a negativity bias. In other words, we evolved from the nervous apes, not the chilled out apes, right? And so our nervous systems are always, our amygdalas are always looking for danger. And so we approach every, every situation from that negativity bias. And so we come to work with this negativity bias and we kind of contracted. 
And so I think that as we open up, we become more creative, we become more capable, we become more uh, alive, right? And so when we as leaders approach a situation and show some vulnerability, the organization reflects that vulnerability and they open up as well. So uh, it's really interesting. So as an example, if you're going to a party, maybe a dinner party that your spouse is invited to you to and you don't know anybody there, you just come with kind of this, this shell on, but soon you meet somebody at the line of food and you start talking. I call it drawing down the water line, like on an iceberg. You start to see more and more of each other's iceberg. And you exchange your names, you exchange your pleasantries, where you're from, and all of a sudden you discover some shared experiences. And from these shared experiences becomes a relationship, right? Well, so the same thing is happening all the time at work. If we just come into these meetings, you know, and it's all just about work, then people retain this shell around them and they're contracted. But the more we as leaders share of our own selves, of our own vulnerabilities, our own failures, the more other people are allowed to kind of let their hair down as well. Google did a study a, uh, a number of years ago on what makes the most successful teams, uh, Project Aristotle. And the number one factor they found was not intellectual horsepower or diversity or where they'd gone to school or anything like that. The number one factor was psychological safety. Now for a leader, this ability to show that you're vulnerable, you're authentic, you're all of that, helps create that psychological safety. In fact, super interesting I, how we're wired this way. There's this another study where um, people were filling out a form online with a chat bot, right? The chat bot was asking them questions and the people would respond. And you know, there's lots of questions about the person, but one of the questions was, tell me a time when you failed. You know, and we don't usually, we live in an Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn world where we only share the best of ourselves. And so most people either skipped this question or they answered very, you know, a, a very, sh in a short way. In group B, in the that was the control group. In group B, along the way, the chat bot, she's talking, she, I'm using air quotes. She's saying, hey, my name's Karen, I'm a chat bot. I've been programmed a certain way. But sometimes my programming breaks down and I don't react in the way that you know I would like to or the people who built me would like to. And that's too bad because I really like to give good results. Next question, tell me about a time when you failed. <laughs> now this time, people answer more honestly. They're, they're giving long responses and they're sharing all these vulnerabilities. But they know it's a chat bot. We are so wired to reflect vulnerability that we'll be vulnerable with a chat bot. And so you might imagine the power that this has in the work environment as a leader or as an individual. If we ourselves can show up in our full authentic self, then it allows those around us to show up in their full authentic self. And the reason this is important is because we move from this contraction to an openness. And it's in this openness where we can be our full selves, we can be creative. This is where we drive the best results. So again, this is not just a feel good thing, this is how we are we're just better as human beings. We're better as workers. We're better with our customers, with our everybody. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I feel like we need to take a pause, Scott, just to absorb all of this. <laughs> but I, I seriously think I don't, I don't want to jump into a question right away because there was so, so much in there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my pleasure. So if I if I go back to the questions, I want to go back to a question that Melissa kind of got into earlier, sure. which um, so so we know meditation is great. People who do it once in a while, they say, oh, yeah, when I do it, I really feel good. And uh, still a lot of people report to us that they find it very difficult to stick to it and to do it on a regular basis. Are there any secrets? Yeah, sure. So yeah, suggestions you might have to help help us all sure. to do it. Yeah, would love well, to. Well, let's hear talk. That. Let's talk about the construct for a little bit. So, in you know, meditation as we talk about it at work is definitely secular, right? And and the research that we've done is is definitely secular, but it started as a spiritual tradition, and even in uh, you know, often associated with the East, but every almost every spiritual path or religion has some sort of breathing or prayer or something to go along with it. So in religion, you have this construct, which is very powerful. You have an, an away from motivation and a towards motivation. What do I mean? Away, I don't want to go to hell. I do want to go to heaven. You know, I don't want to get reincarnated a thousand more times. I do want to have nirvana. 
I don't want to have suffering. I do want to have you know, enlightenment. So in a, in a spiritual path, you have a construct that makes it very powerful, and you have a community that's built around that construct so that I go to church, or I go to temple, or I go with a community to meditate. It becomes part of the culture. So that's, that's how over the last you know, several thousand years, people have stuck to it is because there's this construct that makes it whole. Now, in the secular environment, we don't quite have that um, away from and towards that are as powerful. Right? We're not talking about heaven and hell or reincarnation and suffering uh, in, the, in the secular way. And so when I talk with people who have come to my meditation class, I always say, look, it starts with intention. Because if you don't have a clear intention, there's no way it's going to stick. It's just like physical exercise. So, Pierre, if you invited me to go running you know, tomorrow morning, um, I'd go because you know, it sounds good. We're friends. Let's go, let's go for a run. Um, but the next day... I'm gonna wake up at 5.30 in the morning on my own and my legs are gonna be sore and it's gonna be dark outside and it's gonna feel like work. I'm like, wait, my friend's not here, so why should I run? Mm -hmm. But if I have a clear goal, like you know, maybe my wife and I wanna complete a 10K, uh, a 10K race that's two or three months from now. Okay, well that gives me a clear goal to start with and that gives me some motivation. You know, and along the way, I can see the signposts of my improvement, I can see that uh, my running is getting easier, or maybe I start to see the benefits. Maybe I'm starting to lose a little weight. Okay, let's take the same analogy, the same metaphor for meditation. If I don't have a clear idea of why I'm doing it, maybe I'll do it once with a friend, or I'll go to a class, but you know, uh, maybe the next day I have stuff to do, and it, it feels like a selfish pursuit, so why should I do it? And so for me, if I go back to my own motivation, right? I'll, I'll just speak for myself. When I meditate, when I do my own, I'll call them spiritual practices, when I do them, I'm a much better version of myself. You know, I have less, so look, my, my mental model is, okay, I'm Scott, I have a physical body, I have mind, which is often busy with future or past, I have emotions like anger or frustration, and those three things, mind, body, emotions, are terrible drivers of my life, right? But I think that when we, when we do this practice, we kind of calm those things down and there's, we're, we're accessing a different part of ourselves. We're accessing a part that is more capable, that is um, a bit more infinite. And when we do that, uh, everything feels better, right? And so for me, look, we've all had days when we had a moment or a day when regardless of what came at us, we felt like we could handle it. We had our resources fully available to us. And we've also had days where, look, no matter what happened, we ended up in a crying mess in the corner, or we ended up just frustrated. So for me, that's the heaven and hell. That's the, the good days and the bad days. I want more good days. And I've been doing this long enough to know that when I, if I'm having a really bad day, and I'm honest with myself, and I ask myself the question, hey, have you put in the work? The answer is always no. Mm -hmm. It's always no. And so then it, gets me, it gives me motivation to get back on track. So for, so for someone starting out or trying to build a practice, my advice is first, start with a strong intention. Like, why do you want to do this? Um, and get clear on that. And then build in a habit. My, my favorite quote right now is from James Clear, wrote the book Atomic Habits. And he talks about, our lives do not rise to the level of our goals. They fall to the level of our systems. They don't rise to the level of our goals. They fall to the level of our systems. So if you don't build in a system, you're not going to make a change. It's just not going to happen. So the system could be, look, I'm going to meditate for one minute for a week. One, one minute per day for a week. All right? A minute a day, we can all do that. And maybe, look, maybe when I'm there for my minute, my minute turns into three or it turns into five or it turns into ten. Maybe my week turns into a month. And over the course of a month, because some of these things take a little bit longer, over the course of a month, and also maybe I'm journaling along the way to see, you know, how did I feel today? I can start to see these subtle changes and sometimes not so subtle changes that come with meditation. So what we know is you got to have an intention and it takes some time to put into practice and build a habit. So if you can get to the point where you get over the hump and it becomes a habit, then you'll start to see when you take it away, it's like, oh, whoa, don't take that away from me. I, I need it. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Well, thank you so much. Everything you just mentioned, uh, Scott, is great for all our 21-day challenge participants. So I hope many are on the call. We have 
close to, I think, 110 people on the call today, and, and hopefully Great. many are there to hear you, so thank you. So uh, we're, we're gonna start the Q&A. Before we do this, actually one quick question. So for people who, like, like what you did, the, the amazing transformations you did at LinkedIn, Scott, who wanna start to do something in their organizations, would you have any, like, one tip or idea or insight for them on how to get started? Sure, um, and I'll, I'll give you some resources in a minute, but I would say a couple of my leadership strategies are go where the energy is, meaning mm -hmm. if you are excited about doing something, just do it. Very rarely I found, you know, um, is there more resistance? Well, there's sure, there are some places that will have resistance, but, but go where the energy is, meaning if you're excited about leading a meditation class, don't think about the program you're gonna build in five years, just start by leading a meditation class. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is more people show up. You know, then you'll meet Joe from accounting and Jane from, you know, from sales, and all of a sudden there'll be more people there. And more people raise their hands and say, well, I'd like to do it too. Uh, so just, just get started. Um, to, to go deeper, a set of resources. So my friends, uh, some colleagues of I and I, have built a playbook for people who want to bring mindfulness to their workplace, and you can find it at Mindful Workplace Alliance. I, I don't, I forget now if it's .org or .com. I can, uh, Pierre, I can send you uh, a list of resources after. And we have a playbook that's downloadable from that site, and also uh, we've created a LinkedIn group to basically to build community among people who want to. Uh, bring mindfulness to their workplace. So between these two things, uh, it's the playbook of here's how you can do it, and it's also a community to ask questions. And for me, I had to build this because I had so many people who wanted to have lunch and ask me those two things that we, I, I couldn't scale. Um, and so like any good startup, we had to build the resources for ourselves first. So I'll, I'll send you those after. Excellent, well, thank you so much. So I'm gonna turn it back to Melissa, and then we're gonna go into the Q&A shortly Great. after. Wonderful, thank you so much, Scott and Pierre. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and start asking them now in the, in the panel. I already see some coming in and that's great. We'll get to those in just a moment. And just one reminder before we do get into that Q&A, um, for those of course who are participating in the 21 day challenge and already using the Hello Mindful app, you already know that you can uh, design your own breaks using the Mindful Breaks page. And hopefully today's session has given you some inspiration to start doing that after hearing uh, Scott's insights. And then for those of you who are not already familiar with the app or if you're interested in the in the uh, uh, 21 day challenge or the app, please feel free to contact me directly. And I'll go ahead and give you my information now in the panel. Uh, okay. Wonderful, and now we're all set for the Q&A. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. So I'm, I'm gonna take a look here at uh, the question. There's one practical question from James Scott about the breathing that we did. Uh, what is the significance of breathing in through the nose and then breathing out through the mouth? Any specific thing, or is it just part of making it more structured and... I think it serves a couple purposes, uh, and I don't pretend to know the, I don't know that I pretend to be, well, I'm not gonna pretend to be the expert on this particular one. Mm -hmm. um, if you, and there is some good research out there, so if you just search on four, seven, eight breathing, uh, mm -hmm. you'll come quickly to the doctor, I forget his name, but there's lots of uh, YouTube videos and others where he, where he talks about it in more in depth. Uh, mm -hmm. As a medical doctor, kind of looks like Santa Claus. Um, but I, I think there's two things. One is it gives some structure to the mind, right? It's something to think about and focus on. And two, I believe there's something that is in the circular nature of our breath, uh, but that's the part that I, I don't pretend to know, be the expert on. Okay. okay, and then Laura's asking, how do you convince upper management to expand mindfulness and related programs? Yeah. I think, uh, so at LinkedIn, we started by doing. Um, you know, it, it wasn't, it was all volunteer-led. We have a wellness group, uh, and, and the volunteers just kind of tucked into those wellness efforts. And we were all just doing it as volunteers until, and then for me, I made the proposal to our leadership team um, 
And you know, I think we're in a special place in LinkedIn because our CEO, Jeff, is out talking about mindfulness. He's out talking about meditation and compassion. Uh, he's an investor in the in headspace, you know, and things like that. So it was it was a little easier here. But if you're in a place that is a little more skeptical, I would say first just start. First see if there's energy for it, right? And if there's no if there's no energy for it, even within the employees, then you kind of have your answer. But if there's energy for it, you know, like the 30 day challenge didn't cost us anything to do. And 1,600 people of the, at the time, maybe nine or 10,000 people signed up to do it. That led me to believe that, that, wow, there's a there there. There's really, truly interest. And the more stuff we volunteered and the more it just became uh, apparent that this was needed, then it's a much easier sell. Uh, if, you're, if your company is very data-driven, there's lots of information out there, lots of research papers on the benefits if they're looking for ROI. And in the... I believe in the playbook and the resources that we provided uh, includes some of those you know, links to research papers. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, and I'm seeing many questions about uh, some of these resources. So we're gonna, once, once I get the links from uh, Scott, we're gonna send them to everybody. So you're gonna be able to take a look at the playbook and other resources that, uh, that Scott mentioned. Great. Uh, Melissa, any questions you see that you'd like to yeah. see? Um, Kristen offered here that the 478 breathing is Dr. Andrew Wheel, or, or W-E-I-L. Um, so yeah, just for the group here. And then Rachel had another question. Um, what qualifies someone to lead a meditation circle? Could anyone do it? Or do you recommend undergoing certain training or having a certain amount of practice yourself? It's a great question, and I think it depends probably on uh, the level your program is at. And so it, it certainly helps, it certainly gives credibility when you have your own practice, right? So if someone is just starting out and they've only meditated three times and they're ready to lead a circle, I think you can still do that, but I think you should present it as doing that, right? You know, if, if nothing exists at your company and you get people together, it's there's different levels, right? If you're, if it's a company-sponsored thing, or if it's, hey, Scott and Melissa are getting together in this conference room at three o'clock, there's a different level of uh, expectation. And so I think just being open and honest about, if that's you, hey, I've only done this three times, I'm really excited, I'm gonna do this anyway, every Thursday at two o'clock, I'd love for you guys to join me. Just being open and honest about where you are is totally fine. Mm -hmm. I think once you get further along, and like in our case, if we have a, if we have an, a, a program that's a little further along, the expectation is if you come to a meditation class, the person knows what they're doing, right? So, so I still like to give volunteers that leeway, um, and I'll do, I, I do a little bit of vetting, and the vetting I'm looking for is, I don't wanna make, I want to make sure that whatever we do is secular. And I get surprised sometimes, you know, like last week a guy emailed me, he's like, hey, can I send, can I send this thing about this external mindfulness group out to the broader audience. I was like, sure. And then he forwarded it on and it was totally this religious thing. Uh, I was thinking, uh oh, whoops, I, I forgot to I forgot to do a little more vetting. So everything that we do, we want to make sure that it's secular, right? Because we don't want to get into any arguments about uh, you know separation of you know blah blah blah. But generally I think as long as you're advertising it and presenting it for what it really is, then it's okay to have you know less experienced people lead it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, one idea just came to my mind regarding the less experience. It's always possible to do a guided meditation where you listen to a meditation teacher and do it all Correct. together. So that's also a, a possibility. Correct. In fact, this is, uh, and, and you can do that lots of ways. You could use any of the apps that are available and just mm -hmm. push play. Uh, this thing that we're doing with Wisdom Labs, uh, as an example, is is designed for just that. So it's called an ambassador program. Um, you know, we we pay for the support, but basically, we're rolling it out to 13, 15 different locations. And the only requirement for the leader in that location is they are responsible for getting people in the room, right? And then there's this kind of canned material. Uh, you know, we use Wisdom Labs, but there are other things out there canned material that this person can use. And that's, I think that's a really good option. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Great. Okay, 
Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, Melissa, if you don't see any other um, questions yeah. that you want to bring up, we can uh, we can thank Scott and conclude our wonderful session. <laughs> yeah, uh, there are some great questions uh, in here. We we kind of covered a lot of these. But um, I think this is a good one. I don't think we've really covered this. This is kind of more technical. So Scott, any advice for keeping your mind from wandering during meditation? Yeah, it's interesting. So I'll answer it in two ways. Um, I, I do a session now twice a week. And at the end, I'll ask people if they're comfortable to share, you know, how was your experience? And a few months ago, this guy at the end, he kind of had this look on his face. He raised his hand. He goes, it didn't work. I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, what, what happened? Tell me about your experience. He's like, well, I wasn't able to keep my mind completely blank. I said, oh, okay, okay. I said, well, how do you feel? He goes, oh, I'm so relaxed. I am so, re this is the most relaxed I've been in years. And the rest of us just started laughing. I'm like, dude, it worked. <laughs> So there's this idea that meditation is about not having thoughts, and this, that's just not true. Um, that's not what it's about. It's having freedom from your thoughts, right? So it's this idea, so sometimes we think, am I doing this right? Because I still have all these thoughts. And the idea is to not have thoughts, it's to just have freedom from them. So if you're, ha if you're having thoughts, it's, I would recommend trying some of the techniques that are more guided or give the mind something to do just sitting in silence and hoping for quiet is not a great strategy for beginners so using some of the apps that are have guided meditations uh, things that are doing like a body scan where you're where you're actively engaging the mind um, to to be with the process for some people for me I like to use a mantra and so singing the same word over and over kind of uh, gives the brain something to focus on and allows it to chill out a little bit but then if you're, if you're in the middle of meditation and you just find yourself thinking, just don't worry about it. Just keep going and refocus on the breath, refocus on if it's guided, refocus on whatever else is going on. Excellent. Well, thank you for this great treat, Scott. Uh, we uh, look forward to continuing to spread those great insights among our challenge participants and beyond. And uh, we wish you a great mindful rest of your day. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. And uh, people feel, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn and uh, have an excellent rest of your day. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Melissa. Thank and you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.